Hello, welcome to Mission Nonprofit. I'm your host, Robert Cam. On Mission Nonprofit, we feature a local nonprofit from the Thurston County area, and every month we feature a different one. This month, we've got the Olympia Safe Streets campaign. And with me to talk about the Olympia Safe Streets campaign is Karen Mesmer. And Karen Mesmer is a former council person and local bicycle and pedestrian advocate. Karen, we want to make those streets safer because my buddy John fell down on his bike and he hurt his elbow. He broke his elbow. So let's get some rubber streets. Can we do that? Can we make them all rubber? No, I don't think so. Oh. I don't think okay. so. Well, we'll have to settle for what we can get. What are right. some of the things that you guys have done or, or, or are striving to do to make the, street, the streets safer? Well, first and foremost, in Olympia, for example, we have a comprehensive plan. And it's important that we have acknowledgement of walkability, uh, the ability to bicycle safely, that we have those kind of goals and policies in our plans. And back in 1996, we had been involved as individuals and as Olympia Safe Streets in the development of the initial big changeover for the comprehensive plan for Olympia, where there is a lot of acknowledgement of that. We want to be a walkable community. We want people to have the ability to ride safely and use a bicycle as an alternative so that they, they don't just feel that they must have a car in order to get places. So we were involved in the comprehensive plan development. And the big overarching first thing is you need a comprehensive plan that says it is our aim and our goal to have safe streets, to have the ability to walk and ride safely in the community. And the Olympia Comprehensive Plan has very good goals and policies. So our vision is good in this community. That's, that's I think, the real overarching good news. What happens after that? That's the big question. So you think sometime in the future, our goal is that we will be this safe and inviting community where you'll be happy and able to ride your bike or walk safely in your community. The reality is the devil is in the details, as we say. And so how wide is the sidewalk? Is there a bike lane? Is there a, an ability to cross streets safely? Are there sidewalks and is there connectivity in new developments? That's the standards and the codes and the design and development standards detail that we've worked on for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about bike lanes. Bike lanes are helpful to bicyclists, mm -hmm. making, making streets safer for bicyclists. Right. Um, we're talking about bowl bouts. That's where mm -hmm. uh, the, the sidewalks are, are built out to, mm -hmm. to go into the street so that uh, people can, don't have to cross so far right. to get across the street. And then um, you're talking about sidewalk uh, length. Is, is that another one of the safety? Well, an example with sidewalks is how wide is the sidewalk? So mm -hmm. there's room for everybody. People can pass on the sidewalk. But another example is where do you put the trees? Because we like to have trees in our community. In a new development, the requirement is that you put trees in. But you wouldn't want that tree to be in the middle of the sidewalk, for example, or it would make it very inconvenient to walk around it. So there's specific drawings that the city has in the rules that say this, the tree must be out at this edge of the sidewalk. It's down to that level of detail. And what we did, once the comprehensive plan was in place, one of the efforts we were very involved in was development of the street standards, they're called. And that's the, the specifics about how wide a street is, how, how uh, narrow the lanes are, which makes cars go slower and crossings shorter. So down to the specifics of that, we were involved for several years in a process of going through the street standards for the city of Olympia. How wide is a local street in a neighborhood? How wide is the street in a commercial area? Can trucks get by? Can the fire truck get through? But not having the streets so wide that people feel free to speed on those streets and it makes it uncomfortable to walk or it makes people feel uncomfortable riding their bicycle because the cars are too fast around them. So we went through a long process with the city of establishing those exact specifications. And we were involved in a committee that the city council appointed and went through a couple year process. Then after that, those had to still be adopted into what's called the engineering design and development standards. A huge notebook, I should have brought it, 500 pages. 300 drawings. So if you were going to build a new housing development in Olympia, you would look at these exact drawings and specifications about how to make that bulb out correct. So 
Where does it come out? What, how is it rounded? Where do those ramps go so that people can get across with a stroller or a wheelchair? All those things are very specifically laid out in the, in the standards. And that's something that you guys put in the comprehensive plans back when, um, back in 96? Is that what we were talking about? Or is this something that's... The, the 96 adoption of the plan was when the big picture was put in. The goals, the policies. But in those, it said, we will have street standards that acknowledge this. We will have narrower streets. We will have sidewalks in new developments. There were statements there but they weren't in the rules, essentially, in a very detailed way so that when you came in to build a housing development or a new commercial area, you would know exactly what to do. So following the goals and policies, we needed to follow along and get them into very specific standards. And that's how it works in any city or county is they have these very specific standards. So that's one of the areas where we've been really involved. And I would say, as members, we were on planning commissions, on BPAC, um, and for me, eventually getting elected to the city council even. And that, if you asked anyone on city council or when I was on city council, I don't think anybody had any question what I was about, which mm -hmm. was I was advocating for pedestrian and bicycle safety and issues related to transportation. And I had other interests, but everyone knew that that was my main focus. Yeah. So as we've spent a lot of effort and time, and, and some of that involves getting on committees and getting appointed or getting elected in this case, to have an influence on what the city is doing in relation to bicycling and walking. So I, I heard you say BPAC, and not everybody knows what that mm -hmm. is. You guys were on all, you said you were on BPAC. Was it mm -hmm. kind of like Olympia Safe Streets being on BPAC, or some of you were in BPAC? No, or? I would say that it's, it, it's citizens getting appointed and being advocates and being involved. And it turns out that the people involved in Olympia Safe Streets have been on Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee and Planning Commission, and in my case, elected. I was on the initial, it was called the Bicycle Advisory Committee, I believe. It was appointed by staff, and that was back in the late, 80s, I want to say. This was before um, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee? Right, before it was an official full committee mm -hmm. and before it even had pedestrian attached to it. It was just the Bicycle Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. And that happened because there was a, frankly, somewhat of a blow up about some safety issues on a particular kind of uh, bike and walking lane on the west side that, uh, that and uh, some access to the bridge that um, got some people pretty fired up. And we went to city council and said, You're, you don't have an understanding about what our issues are. So then they formed a committee to advise them about what the issues are for bicycle safety. Um, but then that evolved into a full advisory committee that I think has a lot of respect. So it's called the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee. It's appointed by the city council. And that group advises city council about what should be done with funding, what should be done with specific standards and projects when they come along. And they uh, work with staff and then they advise the, uh, the council on these kind of things. I think it's a really good system for the council to have. Karen, um, we're about to take a break here in a second, but mm -hmm. before, we go, before we're done with our first half of the show, I mm -hmm. would just want to you to talk briefly about what are your uh, current goals um, or, or what do you feel would benefit the city and, and bicyclists and pedestrians at this point? Like what, is, what is it that, that you know, um, is, is your pet uh, project? What, mm -hmm. what, what is it that you, know, you, you think that we really, really need that's going to help all bicyclists and pedestrians? Well, there's a couple of things. And one, I think, is to have a dedicated funding source for, for example, for pedestrian crossings have dedicated funding so that we can catch up on places where, frankly, in the past, I say we forgot or we didn't understand in the past how important it was to have safe crossings. So we need to retrofit in some areas with sidewalks, with pedestrian crossings, uh, with safe features in streets. And we need a dedicated funding source, and we need to keep chipping away at that backlog of safety issues. So to me, that's one of the one of the key things that we could do now to catch up 
because we're doing pretty well on new construction, but we need to catch up some of our uh, older neighborhoods, for example. So uh, crosswalks. Your crosswalks, bull bouts. Bull bouts, crosswalks, and maybe the center, lights. The lights right, but it, also there, you, if there's a big wide crossing, you might put a median in the middle and have mm -hmm. a safe zone there where right. you know it's wide enough and you can stop and look both ways again if there's so not can, a yeah, signal. You can get across this this segment of the road while with with the cars going this way and then and then stop and wait for the cars going that way and otherwise right. you just you're standing there forever not being able to cross. Right, right. <laughs> well, I tell you what, we're going to go to a break right now. We're going to come back. We're going to talk more about Olympia Safe Streets. Right. We'll be right back in a minute. Pump up the tires on your car. Pump them up. Even if you're not going to drive that far. You use much more gas when your tires are low. Pump them up. Because your exhaust make your car slow, yeah. I'm Paul, master mechanic for the city of Olympia. Pump them up. Did you know that properly inflated tires on your car can save you 144 gallons of gas each year? Pump them up. That's $432. And that eliminates 1.5 tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Low tire pressure increases exhaust emissions, decreases fuel mileage, wears out your tires, and causes poor handling. So check your tires today. A message from your public works department. The price of gas is going to make you mad. Make make you mad. mad. The CO2 is going to make the earth sad. Yeah. Wherever you go in, wherever you are, pump up the tires on your car. Welcome back to Mission Nonprofit. If you're just joining us, our guest this month is Olympia Safe Streets Campaign. And with me is Karen Mesmer, lo uh, former city council person and local bicycle and pedestrian advocate. Welcome back, Karen. Thanks. And I hope that everybody liked that little promo about uh, pumping up your tires. I thought it was fitting into this, uh, <laughs> in this conversation. We're talking about streets and... It's all about using energy efficiently, it right? It is. It's about Very energy good. efficiency in your vehicles. Maybe, right. maybe not. You know, I don't know if uh, pumping up your tires is safer. Maybe it is. I think you got more control. You're more control with your vehicle, so that's safe streets. Okay. But anyway, safe streets campaign. You you advocate mm -hmm. for um, better uh, bicycle uh, lanes. You advocate for uh, pedestrian trails. Mm -hmm. um, you advocate for uh, uh, nature trails. Right, multi-use paths and sure. things like that. And, and we were talking about one of them, the Jailis mm -hmm. Western Trail. Jailis Western guys Trail, right. Do something to, to help with that? Well, there was a new development proposed. Uh, it actually had already been through some processes, and I, I watched the city agendas. I was watching the design review agenda to make sure that something didn't come along that, uh, that wasn't of interest to us. And uh, so this new development, or this development came through and... Uh, when I looked at it and really looked in detail, and this is the part about the devil in the details, the advocacy thing. Now I got out the maps, I looked at the details of it, and it appeared that this fairly large development was going to have trail access to the Chehalis Western Trail, which is great. You know, good news, mm -hmm. this big neighborhood with you know, several hundred houses was gonna have a couple of points along the Chehalis Western Trail where they were providing access to the trail for the neighborhood. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But when I looked into the detail on the map, it turned out that they had designated those segments of the property as controlled by the neighborhood or the homeowners association, and it would be private property. So it had like a lock on it or something. Well, it didn't appear in the images that it would right then, but to be truthful, that homeowners association could have at any point in the future because it's private property, put a gate up or closed off that access to the trail. Having multiple accesses on a trail is good for safety, good for its use, good for the surrounding neighborhood to be able to get to the trail, for people along the trail to feel like I can go as far as I want to and then go back a different way. So we did our advocacy on that by appearing at the design review, speaking and saying these should be public. At that point, the developer, the applicant, seemed a little reticent, but by the time they came back to the next round at the hearings examiner, they had changed their plans, and they didn't say private property anymore. They said public property, and they were showing a picture 
of the design of our public pathways, the most recent standards, 10 foot wide asphalt pathways that they were going to construct. So the good news is that will have a good outcome, I think. We wish that the developer would have read the regulations because that was a requirement that they should have complied with and we wish that the staff would have caught that and I didn't have to go to design review to point it out. Mm -hmm. That's what advocacy is, is if some, in some respects, if the other people who should be going by the rules aren't going to or forgot or didn't notice or didn't learn, you step in and point it out and keep dogging it until they follow them. After all the effort we went through with the comprehensive plan and the standards and the design and development standards, we want these to be something that's true on the ground that actually happens. And in this case, it's a fairly simple process of going to a couple meetings, and now we're going to see that, I think. It's on the plans, and we're going to see that come true. That's not always what happens. Mm -hmm. There's a really big development in Southeast Olympia where the drawings and the way it was proposed and brought forward sounded really good. Look, we're pedestrian friendly. All these pathways and alleyways and lots of streets and connectivity within the development. But there's the drawing and the lines are to the outside of the development. They didn't put streets or trails exiting to the outside enough so that if people wanted to go to the park or the transit or a school or a neighbor, just visit somewhere surrounding them, that they would have really good access. That's part of our requirements. It's what we should have. And we're still involved in a long, protracted process with that that's been going on for years. And this is like, these are things that are already written into, is it the comprehensive plan that they're written into? The comprehensive plan, uh -huh. the engineering design and development standards, the development code, they're in there. But if the applicant doesn't read those, and with all the details, if the staff didn't catch it, that's what we do is we step in and say, this needs to happen. Your job wasn't over once you got it in the comprehensive plan. Now exactly. you have to police it. <laughs> police that's, the comprehensive plan. I think plan. that's a word, police it, and that's what we do. <laughs> and we spend a lot of time on that. We wish we didn't have to, and we wish there was a better education of everybody concerned so that we didn't have to do that. But that's what we spend a lot mm -hmm. of our time on. We've had some successes, and we've had some situations that have been really frustrating, like this, this one big development where now that developed is taking the city to court. Um, this isn't over yet at all. Oh, wow. So. <laughs> and that was the Trillium development? That's the and, Trillium and development. They didn't have um, bus, they didn't have transit access to their new development, and uh, they also didn't have some of the trails. Because when they build a new subdivision, sometimes they have a road that goes like this, and it goes winding all around. Mm -hmm. And then if you were this person, and you wanted to travel to this person's, or, or let's just say even this person's house. You can't just go like that. You have to go down this winding road to get mm -hmm. there. And it's easier for a car. But right. if you're walking or taking a bike, then it takes you much longer. The current regulations require a much more gridded type of development. So, And that development actually did a relatively good job inside the development to have short blocks and the ability to move around within that development. But the connectivity to the outside of the development was as you described. You would have had to go around a long oh, ways to get to the neighboring neighborhood. Uh -huh. And so that was really the, the upshot of the problem with that one. And mm -hmm. that should have been drawn in from the beginning, but it wasn't. So we were advocating to get those connections made. And we're not done with that one. Is that your latest uh, bicycle pedestrian issue that you guys have been involved with, or is there something new or is there something coming over the horizon? What's the kind of the newest, uh, I guess, advocacy, advocacy uh, there, that you're going to be doing? We just uh, submitted uh, comments on the 2012 update to the engineering design and development standards for the city of Olympia and made some comments from our experience about some details about uh, how things play out with uh, connectivity to uh, school and uh, transit bus stops, for example. Um, this is a pretty lengthy and complex set of design standards, and in the last go around of updates, these were not updated, and they're, they're, they're old, they don't reflect 
the comprehensive plan very well. So we've made a number of comments on that. Uh, we've also commented on the city capital facilities budget in terms of the lack of funding for pedestrian crossings, for example. Mm -hmm. So we comment on things as they come forward uh, through the city and watch for processes where someone needs to come in from the outside and pay some extra attention to bicycling and walking. I recall a, a big vote a few years ago. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. remember how many, how many years, maybe it was five years ago. It was the, um, the uh, utility tax that went toward um, right. basically public pathways or, mm -hmm. or actually, yeah, I don't know what the, sidewalks and pathways, is that right? right? And were you guys involved with getting that passed? And is, yes. Was that a success for Olympia yes, Safe Streets? Yes, that was, that was passed in 2004. Mm -hmm. That was the utility tax for parks and pathways. And you'll see some very, a very nice logo that was developed for that. And we are now spending um, over a million dollars, roughly a year, building new sidewalks from that funding measure that the voters approved in order to do this catch up where we didn't pay attention to needing sidewalks for decades worth of development and need to go back in and retrofit in some places to make it possible for people to get to uh, school safely, to get to the transit stop and so forth. So that was a big success and the same people that are involved in Olympia Safe Streets were mm -hmm. uh, behind that uh, and a number of other people uh, behind that uh, campaign effort. So we're, we're going to see a lot more sidewalks in the, in the coming years and, and, and maybe some more public pathways. And so that'll be good for, for our uh, bicycling and pedestrian friends out there in, in TV land. Mm -hmm. So um, look forward for that. And let me just ask you, uh, um, why is it important for you guys to do what you do? Why is advocacy important? Well, like I said, we, we, we wish in some ways that we didn't have to do it. But... For me personally, once I've worked on something like a comprehensive plan with goals and policies, I want to see that play out on the ground in actual projects and see that we're implementing the standards and the detail of what I've been working on. A good example of the street standards is coming down State Street um, near the newer uh, East Bay development area. There's new bulb outs along that street. And the crossing distance now for those crossings where there's no traffic light and that's okay is much shorter. You stand out much further in the street on a safe curbed bulb out mm -hmm. and cars can see you. You can eyeball the car and say, I'm here and this is a crosswalk and they stop. Right. That is if, especially a, if there's cars parked along that road, you could right. just be right behind them. And so you're now out further but you're on a curbed area where you're going to feel safe but mm -hmm. you step out you look you get the contact and you get a short distance to cross a couple of lanes mm -hmm. to get to the other side of that bulb out those bulb outs are built to the standards that are re the result of the goals and policies the street standards and the engineering design and development standards that whole process so it's really satisfying to see that and see that people safely cross that cars now recognize more because of those bulb outs that that's a place that that's an example of I think what's satisfying about being an ad advocate is seeing it play out people feel more comfortable walking they're enjoying it more and the community is acknowledging that that's the right thing to do excellent well, we only have a, a minute left but we wanted to bring up uh, Walk 21 and, and your involvement with Walk 21. Tell us what about that. We submitted some proposals. This is an international walking conference that happens around the world, actually, uh, and it's being held in Vancouver, B.C. this next week. Uh, Chris Hawkins and I submitted a proposal idea for a paper about advocacy and how to go about it in a, uh, in a comprehensive way. And we are presenting next week, uh, presenting our paper at that conference at Walk 21. So it'll be exciting to be with other advocates and professionals, by the way. This is people who are uh, professionals in the bicycle and pedestrian world will be there, but advocates will too. And, and it'll be a really fun and exciting place to be to really immerse ourselves uh, since this, for most of us, this is not our full-time job. It's our night job, as we call it. So you'll get to share your ideas and get some 
from Absolutely. We are very excited to learn new ideas there. Excellent. Okay. Well, that's all the time we had for me. Uh, unfortunately, you know, I wish we could go on <laughs> and on and talk about bicycling pedestrians and making those streets safer. But we've got to go. So make sure you turn, tune in to Mission Nonprofit next month when our guest will be the Olympia Film Society. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. If you know of a local nonprofit organization that's making a difference in our community, give us a call at 956 3100 extension 103 or send an email to rkam at tctv.net.